Welcome to the Ortega Path of Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega. We're recording this on July 18th, 2017. Okay, this is episode number 12, Enlightenment and Oneness. Okay, again, this series is about, like, you know, the, the topic of enlightenment, um, meaning roughly a kind of like a more evolved way of being, um, you know, comprises goodness, happiness, uh, an accurate view of reality. So, so this idea of oneness, um, it's, it's a feeling of, not just, I guess, a feeling, but the knowledge that everything is one, that we're all connected, that there aren't boundaries between objects. Um, for example, I think right now, there are billions of, of neutrinos, these very small particles, just like streaming through our bodies. And these particles are so small that they actually just go through matter, through most objects without, you know, touching anything, any um, electron, neutron, proton within uh, this matter. So, so, but the idea is, yeah, that everything is connected. And, um, and in, in various traditions of enlightenment, of, of seeking enlightenment or more enlightenment, this is one of the elements, one of the components they try to strive for. So, um, okay. Um, so now, so part of this, I mean, like, you have to, you have to appreciate that um, when they began to um, seek enlightenment, when they began to think about these things, who are we, what's our nature, what's our nation, nature in relation to everything that exists, uh, that was um, 2,500, 3,000 years ago. And, and uh, we didn't really have a very accurate um, understanding of the, the immensity, the, 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 the scope of this universe we're in. I mean, back then, they thought that it was just, um, what, the, the, the sun, moon, and, and, um, and, this, and this earth, and then, you know, there were these lights in the sky, but they really didn't understand how far they were, what they were. So, so in today's world, I mean, like, th this idea of oneness is that we're, you know, one of, a part of everything, okay, that everything's connected, we're part of everything. So again, back 3,000 years ago, 2,000, 5,000 years ago, 500 years ago, um, it might have been easier for, for people to, to sense that oneness. But like, for example, I was reading in Scientific American um, a few months ago that um, our understanding of how many galaxies there are in the universe used to be about, they used to think there were about a couple of hundred billion, okay, and each of these galaxies has a couple of hundred uh, stars, you know, so, so, but they just, you know, the, the updated number is that there's about two trillion galaxies out there. So, so the idea is that like, you know, to, to, um, to understand and, and feel, imagine, sense that we are part, that we, we're all part, you know, of, of this oneness, that, that everything is together. And another way of understanding this is to understand how our universe began. Um, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, uh, all of these two trillion galaxies with the hundreds of billions of stars and other matter within them were compressed into uh, the space the size of, of like an atom. I mean, <laughs> a very small you know, amount of space so that, that's a way to, 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 to understand logically how we, we still remain, retain this oneness. You know we, 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 we ha, you know, we started as one very small, we're one very large entity now. All right, so, so everything, and the other part of this is that um, we are generally of, uh, composed of the same substances, whether it's this table, whether it's like the sky, rain, um, anything, you know, trees, whatever you can think of, um, they're not different um, essential components that, that make up these objects. In other words, like the elementary particles, the, the atoms, the electrons, the neutrons, the protons, these, you know, um, the smaller, the quarks, whatever, have, these elementary particles are the, the basic building blocks of everything. So that's another kind of way of understanding that we're not just one in terms of, of you know, the immensity, the, the scope of, of space, you know, of, of, of our spatial reality. We're also one 
in terms of our basic constituents, what we're made of. You know, we're essentially at our most, you know, essential um, characteristics no different than um, than this table, than than a road, than um, you know, than anything. All right, so. Um, so the idea is, yeah, and energy is flowing through everything. You know, there, there are no boundaries. And um, so, all right, Buddhism teaches this. Uh, various traditions teach this. They, they relate this to a state called samadhi. And it's interesting because, like, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was a bit ambivalent in terms of um, how much importance to attribute to this element of enlightenment, of, of oneness to enlightenment. Because, for example, in Buddhism, there are various meditations um, that they use to, to perceive, to, to be in touch with different elements of reality. For example, um, at one time, at one point, one might be meditating, focusing on, sensing, imagining, you know, experiencing this oneness, that everything is, is one, everything is together, that there are, there are no true divisions between anyone or anything. So that might be the focus of that kind of meditation. Then at other times, they actually um, prescribe the, the, the idea that, that one should meditate on one's separation from everything. In other words, like right now, it's interesting because this, this doesn't just apply to the outside world. Right now, I am talking, right, and I'm hearing myself talk. And so that there's, the, there's the, the me that's talking and the, the, there's the me that's hearing myself talk. And, you're, you know, if you're watching this, you're having thoughts, right? So, but that, you know, there, those thoughts aren't necessarily you because, as, as you can imagine, you can perceive yourself experiencing those thoughts. Whatever you're doing, you could pre perceive yourself doing what you're doing. So, so part of this uh, idea is that, yes, we are one, but, but, you know, on the other hand, there is a difference. There's a, there's a separation. There's, we have a unique identity, a, a unique... Now, like in Buddhism, it's not like it's a, a permanent self. It changes from moment to moment, you know, but, but it is this, this, this sense of self. And it, it's not personal, of course, because it, it is related to everything else. It's, you know, our sense of self, I guess, for example, without an external reality... I don't think we could sense our, our, our sense of, of self because like our self requires a perception of something and, and our thoughts, our perceptions are really about the outside world. Um, so, all right, so anyway, um, so this idea of oneness, I think, is also central to the development of our religions. Um, when religion first began, they were trying to understand, you know, Oh, it rains, it thunders, there are these gusts of wind, you know, there's fire, there's this phenomenon that some of it was very powerful, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, but they didn't understand any of it. You know, they, they, you know so I think the first, um, the first phase of religion had to do with, with assigning, you know, powers to, to, to what happened. So there was like a god of thunder, there was a god of rain, there was a god of gusts of wind. There were gods for, for you know, all these things, you know. And so this was like polytheism, right? And then, then, um, then as religion evolved, they began to realize that, um, you know, these gods were limited in power. In other words, like the god of lightning couldn't produce rain. The god of rain couldn't produce gusts of wind, for example. So, so the idea is that they, had, they, they came to the realization that there must be a um, power um, that, that supersedes, that, that is higher than all these like, gods that, that are relative to the, the various you know, fire and all that. So, you know, so that's where monotheism came along. It was, it was first started by this Egyptian pharaoh, but then that, that died out after a while. And then uh, the, the ancient Israelites uh, revived that, that idea. And, 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 you know, so we have today's monotheism of one God um, derived from this realization that, like, you know, that um, there, there has to be a unifying 
force, a unifying intelligence a governor, really, controller of everything that happens. So, so again, that, that explains uh, monotheism. And, and so the idea is that, uh, yes, there, is, um, there does seem to be a controlling consciousness, I would say. I mean, some people may disagree, but I believe that the universe is conscious. Uh, but it certainly um, is the controller of everything. There's, there's, things don't just happen without having been made to happen. So the idea behind this is... Um, is, for example, um, well, like with free will, with free will, like, you know, we think we have a free will, but things aren't really up to us. There, uh, the way to understand this, the way to, to understand um, that, that, that things don't just happen randomly without needing to happen is to understand that the, um, the, the universe is, lover, is uh, governed by laws of nature, okay? There are the laws, of, you know, there's gravity, there's electromagnetism, there's uh, the weak and strong nuclear force. Force. Then there are the chemical laws, the laws that, that guide chemistry and the biological laws. You know, all these physical laws that, um, that basically determine what can happen and what can't in our universe. Okay, so then if you think about it, and, and just if you go back to the Big Bang, okay, um, that's as far as our knowledge goes. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang, but, uh, but we know something created, and, and we would define that something I think the, theistically, as God, you know, and, um, and it's just a matter of conjecture wh whether or not the, the laws of nature existed before the physical universe existed. I mean, we, because, like, we, we have no evidence of it, and we might be, um, we might want to, to guess that maybe they didn't exist, but, you know, our nature, our, our, our perception of what exists is so limited that that really, really would only be a guess. I guess the, the standard um, understanding in, in physics is that, that, you know, we just can't say anything about it, you know, and many people believe that nothing existed before the Big Bang. But for example, um, just to, to give you an idea, of how limited our perception is of this oneness that, that we're a part of, that, that you know, we want to feel connected with. Um, basically, you know, what they've determined is that the, the, the universe, the part of the universe that we can perceive, the, um, you know, the, the bands of light, the just you know, what we can hear, see, feel, touch, you know, what we can relate to, what we can interact with, with comprises only about four percent, maybe four and a half percent of what's out there. You know, the other 95 and a half, 96 percent of the universe, it's what's theorized to, to um, be dark matter and dark energy, these, these forms of energy that we know are out there because we, we, they do exert a gravitational force, but, but that's all we know about them. So, so again, in terms of like this, this controlling, um, being that I, that I call God and, and, and the, the laws that, that control us, they could have existed eternally. It's hard to say. Um, so, all right, now, in terms of like this, this, this sense of oneness, um, I remember reading years ago that a newborn doesn't really have a sense of separation between itself and the rest of reality. You know, it looks around, it, 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 you know, it hears things, and initially it feels everything is the infant, okay? Um, you know, and, and, and uh, an infant also has this kind of like, there, there are several kinds of like ways that infants, newborn infants especially, um, may different, differ from adults. Um, for example, if, if an infant sees something like with, with peekaboo, this, this um, this game that, that um, parents sometimes play, if, if an infant sees an object, right, and it's, it's hidden from view, then in the infant's mind, it actually may not exist anymore. So, so like the infant, you know, first, it, it may not have a, uh, a clear distinction between itself and, and everything else. And, um, and it also seems to initially have the sense that it is the power of everything that happens. In other words, it cries, and, and all of a sudden, the, the mother appears, you know, 
to feed it or whatever. It, it, it seems to have this, this sense that it can make things happen, you know, at will. And so, all right, so like some of these things, then it, it, it develops and grows and, and understands the real world and understands how it works. But it seems like, you know, uh, early on, uh, infants may have experienced that sense of oneness with everything. You know, they, they open their eyes and they look around and they can't differentiate what is them between uh, what is them and what is um, everything else. Now recently they've, they've done some experimentation and um, it seems like they, they may have a, a sense of self and other that develops quite early, but again, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, that research actually. All right, so, um, so this sense of, of oneness, it, it's, it's something that we strive for because it has, um, first of all, it, 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 it's, it's pleasant to, to experience reality this way, you know, because the, the, the opposite of experiencing this oneness with everything is that we experience separation, you know, between us and everything else. Okay, so like, and, and that this, this, you know, this separation to us, we're, we're biologically hardwired to not really find it pleasant, to, to feel that, you know, isolated, you know, alone, alienated, whatever. So like, so we have a kind of like a natural predisposition to appreciate this sense of oneness. And we, we try to establish it with, you know, the people in our lives, our friends, our family. And, um, and so like, it's something we value, but what, what they've discovered is that um, our natural sense of oneness with everything, because, I, you know, again, I think we, we do, we can perceive it. You can, you know, easily imagine yourself at one with everything. It's just a matter, like, for, for enlightenment purposes, of ex extending it, of just, like, having that experience extend moment to moment, then hour to hour, and day to day. You know, it's really more of a philosophy of perception of how you're going to interpret what you um, see and feel and think and all. But, um, but what they've discovered is um, natural substances like in psilocybin and, and DMT, which actually our, our brain actually produces, psilocybin, um, LSD, uh, and other, other plants um, actually can induce a much more profound um, state of, of, or sense of this oneness. You know, like a person might uh, take LSD or DMT and, and all of a sudden, you know, this, this oneness that I'm talking about, mainly theoretically, you know, I've ex you know, we've all experienced it to a certain extent, it becomes so apparent. So, you know, it's not something that we have to philosophize about. So, I mean, what's interesting is that, like, all right, with LSD, it was a, um, that was an agent that was basically created by human beings. You know, it was actually created in a lab, but other other substances like um, DMT and and different active psychotropic psycho um, active substances are actually very natural to to the world. Um, you know, the, and and so what happens is that there there seems to be an aspect of of nature of of, of botany of of plants that that uh, seems to be related. To, um, to allowing sentient beings like ourselves and pres presumably other animals, you know, because these animals, for example, with, with the mushroom, you know, presumably other animals um, will eat these, these foods and experience similar sensations. I mean, th there, there, they have been, um, there have been studies, experiments, where they've noticed the effects of various kinds of um, drugs, um, uh, plant drugs on animals, and, and they do get affected. So th this this may be, you know, part of of nature's um, way of of evolving consciousness. You know, again, we, we evolved from a from a, a state of uh, well, you know, naturally we're at one point uh, single cells. You know, w without much consciousness, we might have been conscious of light and dark, or, or you know, heat and light, something like that. But, but we certainly didn't have this kind of like evolved consciousness that, that higher animals have and then we have um, more so as human beings. So like it seems like um, nature, the universe, reality, you know, basically is leading species and I, I, I suppose especially human beings, the, the, the most evolved uh, species in terms of um, 
awareness, self-awareness, consciousness to a higher state, to, to a more perhaps accurate, expansive, um, unitary view of, of who we are. So, all right, and so what's interesting is so like, you know, back in the 60s, there was a lot of drug abuse and all, and so they've created these, these laws to prohibit testing of these agents. But now, you know, over the last several decades, they've been relaxed a lot, and they've, they've been relaxed in other countries, and we've been experimenting with these agents. And we, you know, I imagine over the next couple of decades, they're going to have, um, we're going to discover the, the therapeutic uses of them. For example, with, with marijuana now, we have medical marijuana, we, we understand that it has, um, you know, um, pain reducing effects, it has euphoric effects, it has, you know, effects on, on anxiety and all, you know, calms people and all. So, so it may be that over the next two, three decades, we may be um, experimenting, uh, studying these, these agents in, you know, these plants much more thoroughly and then safely, of course, applying them to our human psychology to, again, allow us to continue our evolution as, as a human species to see the world more clearly. Again, though, one of the components of enlightenment is that we want to move from a false sense of, of reality to a true one. A false sense, for example, is to believe that every, the world is flat or to believe that the sun revolves around us, you know, or to believe that, for example, we have a free will. You know, I, I did a whole series on this, about 216 episodes, um, you know, just basically showing how, how no, you know, that nothing is actually, you know, the term free will. What, what is our, our will supposed to be free of? Is it supposed to be free of the influence of our parents? Is it supposed to be free of the influence of what we learned in school, of our friends, or what we ate? You know, I mean, like, so the, the whole notion, so that, that's just an example of, of how in the past we've um, seen reality in a way that it's not this way. And actually, with free will, that, that's a major one. I, I will devote uh, an episode of, of this series to it because uh, in terms of perceiving reality accurately, it's very important to understand that no, what we do is not fundamentally up to us. It's up to that God, that controller of everything through the laws of nature. You know, we're no different than the particles um, in this table and all. All right, so, um, so um, now another way to gain an insight into this experience of oneness is um, to think about um, near-death experiences. People, you know, they, they, they're on an operating table and you know, they, they're, they flatline, their, their heart starts pumping, stops pumping rather, their, their brain shows no or relatively little activity and they're, they're considered like brain dead or, you know, dead to a certain extent. They may have been, they may have been pronounced dead and they may be like dead for now and then they come to, <laughs> to life again or whatever. So now, I, I personally, I don't believe that that, that actually, you know, died. I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm, I'm ambivalent about this. I'm not really agnostic, really. I, I just, I don't know whether they've genuinely died, but they do, they do report this um, as part of the near-death experience, this sense of, of lack of, of, of separation, of, of, of kind of like understanding and feeling um, and knowing that, that they are a part of this, this, this one, you know, apparently more, more wonderful reality, this, this, you know, this, this more of a bliss state in a way. All right, so again, um, so now the, the practical use of this, um, this feeling of oneness, to, to feel and understand and know that we are not individual objects, you know, separated, um, you know, physically, in a sense, from, from each other and from the rest of the world. We're all one. One of the, the, um, the pragmatic values of knowing this is that to the extent that we see ourselves as individuals, that will, to a great extent, breed competition. And it's not just competition between human beings for, let's say, um, limited resources. It's also competition between us and, for example, the rest of the environment, you know, the, the, um, the rest of the ecology. And, and as, as you'll notice, interestingly, Al Gore is going to come out with the sequel to his 2006 An Inconvenient Truth later this month, I think July 28th. And, um, you know, because of, of our lack of respect um, for, you know, 
the, the, this understanding that no, we're not separate from the environment. The environment, you know, we can like hugely affect the environment. The environment can hugely affect us because of this, our, our lack of, you know, proper appreciation of this. We, over the next several decades, have a major challenge just, you know, to, to keep civilization surviving. You know, I tend to be an optimist. I tend to be, you know, to, to think that with uh, new technologies, supercomputers and all, and a change in our political paradigm, we will meet these challenges. But it just, it just gives you an idea that this, this, um, this recognition of our oneness you know, isn't just a philosophical construct. It isn't just like something to immerse oneself in within meditation. It's something that applies to, to not just our interpersonal interactions, but to our interaction with the rest of reality. Uh, that's just very good to, to keep in mind. So, all right, so uh, I guess, you know, we've gotten into this enough for now. Um, now, in terms of, you know, how important an element of, um, of enlightenment it is, certainly it's important when considered relative to what we just explored, this, this, this oneness between us and nature, that, that, you know, we human beings are not just these teeny little organisms in this huge earth and we, we, you know, we, we can't, we have limited effect. No, we have a vast, powerful effect on it. And so like, it is important in that sense. It is important um, to a certain extent in terms of our relations to each other. Uh, it can enhance against cooperation. It can help us live more in harmony rather than competing against each other. I'm not sure it's as important as, as perhaps the, the elements of enlightenment more associated with um, being better people, being more virtuous, more ethical, and especially being happier, because basically, you know, we are hardwired. Our fundamental drive, uh, motivation as human beings is to, to feel happiness, uh, to move toward pleasure and away from pain. So, so this sense of oneness, you know, one can actually, uh, you know, ha be very, a very happy and a very good person without necessarily feeling the sense of oneness, but it does help you know, to, to experience and, and know the reality is, this, is like this. All right, well, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time on the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. Thanks.